I'm Mark Johnson. Tonight on Idaho Reports, we examine the effects of Idaho's two most recent industrial shutdowns, the planned closure of the Bucyrus Erie plant in Pocatello and the shutdown of the Potlatch Sawmill. Producers Paula Whistle and Mark Krein report tonight on the situations in Potlatch and in Pocatello. Join us here tonight on Idaho Reports. The funding for this program is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Friends of 4, 10, and 12. The Bucyrus Erie Plant, Pocatello, Idaho, closing in September. The Potlatch Corporation Lumber Mill, Potlatch, Idaho, already shut down. Tonight, how two Idaho communities are dealing with major plant closures and what hope is there that such facilities can be replaced. Good evening. As the economic analysts are increasingly telling us, American industry is undergoing a profound change. The so-called smokestack and natural resource industries are dying, or at least they are shrinking, while high technology and service industry is exploding. In Idaho, this industrial sea change has been as dramatic as any place in the country, and it has included in the, the loss in this state of 25,000 jobs in the last four years. 8,000 jobs lost in the lumber and wood products industry alone in Idaho. Another 1,500 lost in the mining industry. And now the state's Division of Economic and Community Affairs is convinced that those jobs will not be replaced by Idaho's traditional industries. Tonight, producers Paula Whistle in Pocatello and Mark Krein in Moscow have reports on the closures of two major industrial facilities and the effects that those shutdowns have had and will have on the communities where those facilities have been located. The reports tonight examine the closure of the Potlatch Corporation lumber mill in the small sawmill town in northern Idaho, Potlatch, and the planned closure later this year of the massive industrial plant operated by the Bucyrus Erie Corporation in Pocatello. Paula Whistle has our first report tonight in Pocatello. Paula? The time was in Pocatello back in 1974 when a job with Bucyrus Erie meant exceptionally good wages and benefits and the opportunity to receive further occupational training. But that was back before the recession, when the company was growing and the future need for coal mining equipment was bright. Now being a Bucyrus Erie employee means facing the uncertainty of the unemployment lines. All of this is cyclical in a way, as the plant has a history of ups and downs. It was originally a naval ordnance plant, and its purpose was to manufacture large guns for the battles of World War II. Understandably, work here declined after the war, and finally, in 1964, the government got rid of this facility. A variety of small industries occupied these premises until in 1974, big plans for this site were announced. A mining manufacturing company based in Wisconsin, Bucyra Siri, was to purchase all 168 acres and 1.4 million square feet of industrial space here and in anticipation of a major coal mining boom, was to eventually employ close to 3,000 people. In anticipation of a major population boom resulting, shopping malls, houses, motels, and restaurants were built here. The population of the Pocatello area was projected to reach close to 80,000 by 1978. That didn't happen. According to 1980 census figures, the Pocatello population was at around 50,000 or 30,000 off the projection. And according to one local economist, Pocatello now has enough motel rooms to accommodate a city twice its size. Other predictions were also proved off the mark. The company never employed more than 1,700 people. There was no coal mining boom, and the company, in an already depressed mining market, began to face stiff competition from foreign manufacturers. In late April of this year, BE, having already shut down or sold two other plants, announced it would close its Pocatello operation in October and try to sell this mammoth facility. There are no small Repossession for a closure are the last alternative of way down the line of what can be done to forestall such activity. For those most intimately affected by the closure, the 500 remaining workers, 
the company and labor unions are trying to cushion the blow. This workshop, covering financial management, stress, and unemployment benefits, was recently sponsored for workers and their families. Russ Knapp, a welder with Bucyra Siri, is just one of those who may soon be faced with unemployment. I've worked for BE for seven years, and I'm a welder in their large weld and fab shop. You said you sort of had a feeling that something Yeah, so. well, you know, they've been having layoffs for the last couple of years, and then it was starting to get pretty heavy here lately, and it, you know, it was kind of a surprise. I was in Nampa when they said it. I was watching TV and heard it on the news and just kind of went, wow, you know, but it was, I don't know, I guess everybody could kind of see it coming. Either that or it either had to go one way or the other. Either had to pick up a bunch or quit altogether. So what have you done since that time? I understand that you have been looking for other work. Well, yeah, a guy can't just wait till he's out of work to start looking for work, you know. And uh, I've got some applications out in this area and down in some other parts of the state around Boise and stuff. But the job market right now is it's tight, especially for a welder, uh, somebody in the steel business right now. And uh, I don't know if you're not not willing to either change your craft or whatever, I don't know, it's going to be pretty tough probably. But I've never collected unemployment. And uh, if I was laid off in June or July or something like that, I would probably take a month's worth of unemployment and see just what Governor Evans is going to do as far as retraining or schooling that's available. And, you know, like taking from my dad to me and and generation to generation, it used to be that if you got in school and developed a craft or a skill, well, you were pretty much set for life. But anymore, it seems like if you don't have one or two skills anyway, why sooner or later it's going to hurt you. A lot of those skills are transferable. That is, they can be used in other operations. I hope, <laughs> for their sake. Is it likely they'll be able to find other work in this community? Right now, I would guess not. Our job market is badly depressed. It has been for two years. Uh, right now, we're paying out in unemployment insurance in this community a little over a million a month, every month. That's probably three times what it was two years ago. Obviously, the closure will hurt those who've been employed here, but just how great the impact will be on this community remains to be seen. BE has never operated this plant at full capacity and, in fact, has been reducing operations here for years. BE is not a fixture in this town the way Union Pacific and the phosphate plants are. And, in fact, some community leaders have suggested that the closure may be a blessing in disguise. For example, with BE, in a depressed industry, mining. I mean, you can only find two others who are equally depressed, agriculture and timber. That's Idaho. In a, in a depressed industry, depending on putting all of our eggs in one basket out there in a depressed industry, in the long run, we're going to hurt. They're just not going to profit unless there's a, a swing that we don't see. BE also seems to be rather single-minded in its thrust. It hasn't sought to diversify what it does, and so if mining's up, it's up. If mining's down, it's down. I can see a diversification or a move towards perhaps some high-tech approaches that we haven't used before. You said this isn't a devastating blow. What would you call it? Well, there's a couple of things we ought to look at. For example, in Pocatello right now, there are 28,522 jobs. I should say that's as of the end of 1982. 28,522 jobs. We're talking about 500 jobs. So devastating hardly <laughs> would describe what's happening. It'll have an impact. How much of a spin-off is difficult to say. But we have to realize that uh, four years ago, BE had 1,800 employees. Now it only has 600. We've already absorbed a 1,200 Despite the rosy picture painted by the mayor, local labor analyst Whitmore says, for a variety of reasons, this closure may be tougher on the community than past layoffs at the plant. Three, four, five years ago, we were in the midst of a very good economy here in Pocatello. And that's when the first layoffs from BE started. A lot of the job losses were absorbed because of 
other activities in the area, construction, uh, new shopping mall, things like that to a great degree offset those layoffs. And during that period of time, there was always that hope that the Osiris area would return to its former levels of employment. Now we know that it's final, that they will not return as a major employer in this community. Does so that before have a there psychological was a, impact, yeah, that's, the that's, fact that, that it's final? I think that's the whole thing. And as is the case with any major industrial shutdown, the departure of Osiris Erie will have a ripple effect. For instance, some companies like Valley Canteen Incorporated, the provider of food, pop, and candy machines, depend on Osiris Erie for a substantial portion of their business. Company spokesmen say this will have a drastic effect, and employee adjustments here may have to be made. International Transport gets 90% of its Pocatello business hauling drag lines, shovels, and drills from Bucyrus Erie. And it's likely this Pocatello office will be closed out. The effects of the closure will also ripple into other, less closely tied businesses, like real estate. In an already depressed housing market, there are currently 600 homes on the market, a lot for a town this size. An influx of new homes up for sale could drive housing prices even lower. And there is the lack of disposable income to consider. Most employees at Osiris Erie make around $11 an hour. The company payroll here adds up to a million dollars a month. Some charities may even have to adjust. Employees here poured $53,000 into the United campaign here last year. The impact of the shutdown is also likely to ripple into the schools, although school officials don't know yet just how many students they might be losing. For the city and county, there will be a loss of $60,000 to $70,000 in garbage and water payments and a possible loss of property tax revenue. Still, community leaders are optimistic and see this as a challenge more than a tragedy. What it's done, Paula, is it's brought the Chamber of Commerce and, the, and city government together, along with some other community leaders, to say, okay, let's get our act together, all of us at one time in one place. Uh, here are the leads that we've got. What do you know? What do you know? What do you know? And finally, people are putting their cards on the table saying, here's what we know. And not only, Paula, are we addressing the BE situation, the bigger issue is what is the long-range future of Pocatello in general, economic development-wise. Paula Whistle will be back a little bit later on. As she indicated in her report, there is some hope for a replacement plant to be found in Pocatello to replace Bucyrus Erie. Analysts have much less optimistic forecasts for the old mill town of Potlatch in northern Idaho. Mark Krein tonight has a look at the situation there. Mark? The recent recession, which seemed to have hit hardest during the late 1970s, proved devastating to corporations involved in the timber industry. The Potlatch Corporation, born in Idaho and now based in San Francisco, California, is no exception. And when the recession lasted too long, executives decided to shut down one of their facilities their original facility in Potlatch, which is about 20 miles north of Moscow. So what was once the largest white pine lumber producing plant in the world is now just a monument for the several generations of timber workers that still live in that area. For over 75 years, this part of northern Idaho rumbled 24 hours a day from the nonstop lumber production of this plant, the Potlatch Lumber Mill in Potlatch, Idaho. Since the turn of this century, this has been a one-company town. Up until 1950, the Potlatch Company built and owned every building in the town. During the peak years between 1906 and 1935, about 2,000 people lived here, and hundreds more were associated with the town from all over the Northwest. From the first day of production in 1906, this mill produced strictly two-by-fours, used primarily for home construction. With the drastic drop in housing starts during the 1970s and a major decline in the need for two-by-fours, the Potlatch Corporation decided to temporarily close the plant in August of 1981. At that time, both the town and the Potlatch Corporation had every intention of reopening. That was almost two years ago, and although the economy has improved and housing starts are up, 
The Potlatch Corporation made the decision that this mill was to be permanently closed as of April 1st of this year, which leaves this town of 800 residents without 200 permanent jobs. At the time of the closure decision, local residents and employees had mixed reactions. They kind of waited a long time to tell us that, that it was going to, you know, stay closed permanently. They put me to work somewhere else, I'll be happy. Well, as far as I'm concerned, they always treated me all right. All right, this laid-off employee felt Potlatch always now. intended to close the, the mill and has left down. former employees That's with few talking. options. Come in with 33 years of Potlatch. 33 years. He's a married man, he's got a family, he's got his home. He's worked for Potlatch for 33 years and all of a sudden he's got nothing. He's got an alternative. You take your severance pay and you're done. Or you take a chance of going to Lewiston, Coeur d'Alene, St. Mary's, Pierce, wherever. You take a chance on getting work. You work one day and you lose your severance pay, even if you get laid off then. You work one day and you're laid off and you lost your whole severance pay. They put a man between a rock and a hard place. Potlatch officials said poor economics in the housing industry was the major reason for the shutdown, but the plant's age was also a consideration. Many sections of the mill are crumbling and in need of costly repairs. Corporate leaders also noted strong emotional ties to this facility and constant communication was always kept with the employees. Anytime there was any development, we tried to make it known. Uh, the reason for the long delay in deciding that the mill would have to close permanently was uh, there's quite an attachment to that mill, that, that mill on the part of Potlatch management. A lot of these people have been with the company for a long time and closing the uh, the flagship of the fleet, as it were, uh, is not an easy thing to do. So if there was a possibility that it could be kept open, we wanted to delay until... It, that, that was better in our mind than a premature announcement that it would be permanently closed. Several people, including some local residents, have seemingly written Potlatch off, already labeling it a soon-to-be ghost town. But there are indicators that seem to contradict that thought. Potlatch has several retired people on pensions who love this area and have no desire to leave. Also, many of the homes have already been sold to people from all over Lataw County who also love this area and don't mind the commute. Still, there's a question of the Potlatch workforce and where the jobs will be to support them to remain in this area. In nearby Princeton, just five miles out of Potlatch, are the Edwards and Bennett Lumber Mills, where laid off Potlatch employees had hoped to land jobs. But the workforces are full here, and President Frank Bennett doesn't foresee future openings for the laid-off potlatch employees. Some of the workers have found jobs in nearby towns, and others have moved away. Still, the majority of laid-off potlatch workers are dependent upon this building for a weekly unemployment allowance. But unemployment benefits last only so long, and it is felt if the town is to survive, it must find a major employer. And that's the goal of this organization. The Clearwater Economic Development Association is a nonprofit organization which keeps towns such as Potlatch abreast of employment possibilities and attempts to draw new employers to the area through state and federal grants. And even though there are millions of funding dollars available, CEDA officials aren't overly optimistic about finding a company to locate in the Potlatch area. So I'm afraid what we're looking at in the Potlatch situation is one getting some new employers into the area, or two, retraining those people for jobs outside of the area. And that means those people are going to have to pack up and leave unless we get some new employment opportunities. What Potlatch needs is something that's labor intensive. And what most of the people are trained to do is in the wood products industry. And the wood products industry today is moving um, very rapidly away from labor intensive kinds of production. So what we have is a workforce trained in certain skills in an industry that no longer needs their bodies to do that work. And so the real challenge is what are the growing industries that we could possibly attract or um, what industries, what commercial ventures exist in Potlatch that we could as assist to expand. The local bank is also concerned about Potlatch's future especially with the number of loans that they have carried for former mill employees. In some instances, uh, uh, they're 
there are no alternatives that some individuals will just simply have to sell some of their assets in order to meet their their debts. Uh, that's, I'm sorry to say that, but it's, in some cases, it is a must. Those who own homes in Potlatch face another burden, possible higher taxes. If the value of the land the mill is presently on goes down, local residents will be forced to make up the difference. If we lose, and let's just take a hypothetical figure, if we lose $2 million worth of of value in that plant and we could figure what that resulted in as far as tax dollars, as long as budgets stay at the level they are, those dollars will be picked up by the remaining property owners and it'll be a, a shift to every one of those property owners in proportion to their share of that ownership in that tax base. The middle-aged people were hurt uh, probably harder than the young people, because the young people, uh, uh, more than likely, were renting, didn't have their own homes, and uh, they can move, they can relocate, where uh, it'd be pretty difficult for somebody like myself or somebody at my age or older that uh, was working down there, and uh, uh, we have our own homes here in town. You could sell a home for, here in Potlatch for $30,000 go to Lewiston or Coeur d'Alene or somewhere, and you can buy the same house, but it'd cost you fifty or sixty thousand dollars. What about the future generations of Potlatch? Well, things are changing. It used to be that the majority of high school males would think no further than walking across the street to begin their working career at the mill. That is no longer an option. It seems that in the past, many students, not all, but many students had a feeling that uh, they had an assurance of employment when they finished high school. If they didn't choose to go vocational uh, or to academic training beyond high school, they could go to the mill and would go to the mill and could be employed at a very high paying job and could be employed till retirement. And of course that's no longer the case and, and that's really hit, hit home. And I see an increased number of enlistments in the military and certainly more of a, of a questioning attitude in the student body of what opportunities are there, what, what kind of training is available. Two Idaho communities suffering the loss of major industries with the unemployment, the social dislocation, and the economic consequences that always seem to accompany such occurrences. Both Mark Krein and Paula Whistle are back now to talk a little bit more about these situations. There are obvious similarities in, the, in these two situations, in Potlatch and Pocatello, but there are differences too. Market, uh, for example, in Potlatch, the, the mill really has been a way of life there for people. That's right. Uh, it's, it's almost amazing how many people in the Potlatch area have lived there their entire life. They were born there. They were uh, brought up under uh, people that, uh, you know, parents that were working at the mill and they went to school, graduated, and they worked in the mill and, and now they're retired. Which, I'm, which is probably quite different. I'm sure quite a few people moved into the Pocatello area for just to work at the BE plant. Well, Paula, as large as, uh, as large as BE is, it is still a small percentage of the Pocatello workforce, is it not? Well, that's right. It's less than 1% of the workforce. And obviously, since it's only been here nine years, it would be difficult for entire generations to be wrapped up in it. And uh, also, the workers here are machinists, welders, electricians. Chances are they could uh, transfer those skills to other companies. But in some ways, I would say it's similar to Potlatch in that they aren't wrapped up in the company, but in many ways, they're wrapped up in those occupations. And they haven't looked further than being a welder or being a machinist. And now many of them are faced with perhaps uh, being retrained to find a new occupation. So I would say in that way, it is somewhat similar. Let me ask you both what you've been able to uh, glean about uh, the future of both of these, both of these communities, and the future of the uh, of the industries that want to, to, they hope will be able to replace these uh, that that are gone now. Paula, I saw a comment from David Porter, the uh, state uh, administrator of the Division of Economic and Community Affairs, saying in Pocatello uh, a, a few days ago that a replacement for BE is just not very likely very quickly. Yet the mayor seems. Uh, really quite optimistic. Well, he's optimistic in attracting different kinds of industry to the area, but as far as the plant itself, it, the enormity of it is the real problem there. And even BE, uh, 
the company that says they have several uh, prospects, they say it's unlikely they'll be able to sell it to one particular company. They'll probably have to divide it up, parcel it out, which is the way it was prior to BE moving in. There were 50 uh, different companies there at one time. It was basically an industrial park. But the mayor is looking towards what I think mayors in every city, it seems, in Idaho and every, uh, every other state are looking towards, and that's towards uh, developing high-tech type industries here. Right. What about the future in potlatch, Mark? Well, as I see it, there, were, there will always be people in the potlatch area, but I, I think one of the, the main problems is the future of the, the kids that graduated from high school that, like I said, went straight over to the plant are not doing that. They're, they're going into the Air Force or they're thinking about um, moving out of town or possibly higher education. As far as uh, future industry coming into Potlatch area, that's you know, something I can't predict. Potlatch owns the only decent land in that town, and so someone would have to come in and buy that land, which I which I uh, talked to some of the potlatch officials and they said they would be willing to negotiate something, but that would cost probably a few million dollars just to tear down the facility that's there. Um, to add on that, as long as that potlatch facility is there, I, I talk to people who are still convinced that potlatch is going to reopen that plant, even though they said, you know, it, it's gone, accept it now. So I see that, that kind of being a problem as long as that plant is still there. Uh, lack of willingness to accept the economic realities. Has that been a problem in Pocatello too, Paul? Well, the workers I spoke with seem to accept it pretty readily, and, and it might be that, you know, their fathers didn't work there and their grandfathers, and it wasn't, they weren't as tied as closely to it as obviously the workers in Potlatch are. You mentioned the high-tech industry, which we all know the governor and many others want to bring to this state, but if those kinds of industries do start to come to Idaho, Will they employ the welders and uh, the, the mill workers and the sawmill workers, or, or will they look, be looking for some other sorts of people? Well, from my perspective, I would guess not in many cases. Uh, for example, we have a microprocessing company here, AMI, American Microsystems, and they are going to be hiring about 300 people this summer. They, they just opened a new facility, or they will be opening a new facility, but for a welder, from BE to get a job at AMI at a comparable wage, he would have to have at least two years of schooling in electronics, so I would say that's unlikely to happen. The welder I interviewed said he had applied for a job at a microprocessing plant just in the maintenance department, and they, had told, and they told him he didn't have the proper skills. All right. You have a quick comment on that, Mark, about uh, the high-tech industry? There's not much future, I would assume, for those mill workers in, in the, the electronic industry. Uh, very doubtful, Mark. Uh, most of those workers had been trained on equipment that some of that equipment we saw dated back almost, uh, well, it did date back into the 1800s, and, and very few of the uh, equipment items there were newer than late right. 1950s. Right. Well, we've exhausted our time. Mark Krein in Moscow, thanks for being with us tonight, and Paula Pocatello, thank you very much. That is our time. I'm Mark Johnson. Thank you for joining us. Good night. This program is produced by the Idaho Educational Public Broadcasting System, which is solely responsible for its content. The funding for this program is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Friends of 4, 10, and 12.